We continue reading from Unwind Your Mind Back to God. In today's reading, which continues from Chapter 1 of Book 1, Laying the Foundation, we read to you from Section 8, Part 2, the last and final part of Apply the Ideas. Friend, right now I have a person in my life that is going through reactions. I listened to him and thought, Why can't you see what is really going on? I tried to explain to him what is really going on, even though I know you cannot do that. And then I stopped seeing him through love, stopped seeing that he is the Son of God, just like I am the Son of God. I love that term because it keeps us all the same, except I forgot. I know I was acting out of fear. I wanted to change him, and I could not. I wondered why he could not see what he was doing. He was seeing all this as bad, and I was trying to say, Hey man, you are missing the point. We do not judge because what we see is not real. We do not judge because what we see is not real. It did not work. David, in the past you have suppressed and denied the ego system. The ego has not been raised to awareness. But once you start to raise it to awareness and the stuff starts getting flushed up, there is a strong tendency to want to project. Even though the ego is now being unveiled, you are seeing that the mind is still very strongly invested in it, and that is where the guilt comes in. The transcendence will eventually come where we are able to detach in our mind from those false thoughts, from the attack thoughts. We will be able to just calmly see the false as false. But that is one of the stages that we go through. Once it starts to get flashed up, there is a real tendency to project, to be what Jesus calls the unhealed healer. You want to go around and give healing without having healed yourself, and it is just to watch as we do this and go through it. Last night, the self-concept of being a parent came up. A gentleman said, I have a son and he has a duty to clean the bathroom and he does not. I suggest, I remind, but it is just filthy. I start to get angry just describing this whole dynamic. The parent is another role with a lot of unconscious beliefs about good mom and good dad good moms and good dads do it this way. We have these unconscious beliefs that are down there. The basic situation with parents and children is that there is often a big struggle over control. This is not just with parents and kids. It can be in all kinds of relationships. The world teaches that you have to tame and train this ego to at least adapt and become what normal, somewhat normal in order to function. It teaches that there are things that you have to do in life. You can always tell when you are sliding into ego. It is that control feeling and the tone of voice when the demanding and the commanding starts coming out? The Holy Spirit never commands and never demands. He reminds and suggests. Friend, he does not teach high school. <laughs> David, right away, the intent will come in relation to certain situations or certain children. Wait a minute. I have reminded and suggested to a certain point. Then I have to really bear down here. But really, it is always our own lesson. 
children are great mirrors. Whenever we start feeling uh, we are off the beacon, whenever we start controlling, start feeling controlling or angry, we can pull back to a level of spirit or a mind level of what is the deal? We are equals here. Did you forget? There are just these roles now. Wait a minute. This is the role. I am the dad, you are the son and you are the daughter. As soon as the mind clicks into I am the role, then control comes in. There are not any roles in heaven. Friend, but is that not a fact? I mean, it is an illusion, but it is also a fact, right? David, it is an interpretation. The only fact is that of Christ or oneness. But within the dream world, these identities, these self-concepts that we make up include a lot of roles. Friend, we also have perceptions about what the roles mean. As a parent, the role issue sometimes is hard to let go of when you have to say, you need to do this, you need to do that. David, yes, the real problem is the authority problem. The authority problem is with God. It comes down to the question, can I create myself or was I created? What happens is when you get into I can create myself, that is where the self-concept comes in. Not only can I create myself, but I have. I chose to be a parent or to go into education or to take a business job, etc., you can see that all these lessons that come up are really ways to start to loosen our identification with these roles. And we see that all of the expectations that we place on our brothers that seem to be violated by their behaviors are really just expectations. We are reading meaning into a situation from our own goal being identified as a male or as a course in miracles teacher, I perceive somebody as trying to weaken my position. Here it goes again. I have another concept or construct that I have to let go of. As long as there is defensiveness or fear or anything that is uncomfortable within us, we are still clinging to some kind of role or some kind of a concept that we believe is more valuable than the truth. Friend, when it comes to kids, I feel that I have to put on a different hat because they have certain rules and regulations they need to follow in order to get where they need to be or where I think they need to get to. David, it is really about judgment. You are afraid because you believe that without the ego, all would be chaos. Yet I assure you that without the ego, all would be love. Text, chapter 15, section 5. See that when the mind had these dark beliefs in it and there was all this seeming horror and chaos, when it seemed to buy into the belief in separation, all this judgment was a way to try to bring some control and order into the chaos. Yet the fact that you can do this and bring any order into chaos shows you that you are not an ego and that more than an ego must be in you. For the ego is chaos. And if it were all of you, no order at all would be possible. Yet, though the order you impose upon your mind limits the ego, it also limits you. To order is to judge and to arrange by judgment. Therefore, it is not your function, but the Holy Spirit's. Text, chapter 14, section 10. It takes a lot of trust to let go. 
You are talking about these ideas and beliefs, about letting go of these constraints and restrictions and judgments about your children. The underlying belief is that if you let go of that, all hell is going to break loose. You are afraid they will grow up and be a reflection on you. What wild children you have. <laughs> you see how it goes? The ego will just run with that. It does take a lot of trust to generalize this to your family situation. It is by watching your emotions and reactions that you can tell whether you are listening to the Holy Spirit. Let your yea be yea and your nay, nay. Book of James, chapter 5, verse 12. But be really clear that if there is still egocentricity and codependency involved, if we associate following the Holy Spirit with saying yes to everything and everyone, you can see how you could just totally give away your sense of integrity. The Spirit is in there. If we just stay with our emotions and keep surrendering, the Spirit will tell us when to say yes, when to say no, and when to set some sort of guideline that could be helpful. We can set guidelines, but we must watch for that insistence, the demanding and commanding, and getting upset when others do not seem to follow it. The whole lesson for us is to always be extending the light and extending the peace. It really does get at our own beliefs and expectations and roles. That is always the lesson. What do I value in my mind? What am I holding on to that is more important than seeing the Christ in this person or child? Friend, I can think of certain conflicts that I have had with my children and the thought that came to me was that if I get into a conflict, there is obviously something I am not willing to see. But I lose patience and say, I am not ready. I am not willing to go that far. Let me just do this. Let me get into the conflict of it. When I can just pause, I get the answer, so to speak. Maybe it is just about taking that extra moment to wait in order to see it. So in a situation, maybe a classroom situation, it is not necessarily necessarily to let it go. It is about asking what I need to see. And like you said, is this something that I can say yea to or is this something I can say nay to? David, and be at peace with either way. Friend, right. I think teachers have a really hard time because society puts so many role expectations on teachers and what they are supposed to get out of each student in order to go from grade to grade. So you cannot just have that free will kind of attitude that you can in other jobs or other situations. David, that is one of those sneaky ego ploys that certain situations or certain people have it more difficult or easier. And really, what that does is fly in the face of the first principle of miracles, which is that there is no order of difficulty in miracles. That is the hardest one. If you can get the first principle, you do not even need the other 49. But the ego strategy towards all kinds of conflicts is basically to always say, if only something were different in the world. It is always trying to change something on the screen to bring about the peace. The mind is resistant to seeing that it just takes a change of perception in the moment. That is the one thing that the mind in the deceived state is so resistant to. In the end, that is what the atonement is. To start to see 
There is nothing outside of me that can give me peace or take away my peace. To do that, though, you literally have to transcend the roles. One guy asked one of these channeled entities, How can I be enlightened and still be in the corporate world? And the answer came back, You cannot. The deeper we go and the more we transcend the concepts, the more we will be used in ways that we cannot even fathom or foresee. But the ego wants to take all the seeming concepts and situations and project them out into the future. I see this as a path of being present in the moment. Whatever the situation is that you seem to be in, and using those opportunities without getting too concerned about the next steps or trying to figure out, how is this ever going to work? Am I ever going to be a teacher and be enlightened? Or am I going to have kids? It really takes that internal guidance of being shown. Okay, where do I go from here, God? Holy Spirit, what is the next step? That first step, that all learning situations are helpful, is a very big step. But sometimes people will take it too literally. It does not matter if you are on a factory line, if you are hang gliding, what country you are in. It does not matter. You do not want to get too anchored to the situation and use it as a justification. For example, a woman I had, I know had problems in her job for years. She would say things like, I'm going to get it. I have to be able to get it while at this job. I know it is not the job that is the problem. I know it is in my heart. So I'm going to stay with the job year after year because I know I should be able to get it here. But that is not how it works either. There are times when it is time for a shift, whether in a relationship or in a job situation or whatever, where the Holy Spirit will give that internal guidance that it is time to move on. That is the really fine line between not getting so identified with the particular situation or role and then turning that around and using that as justification. The ego will do that as well. But just try to be in touch with the intuitive voice that recognizes if it is time to move on. That happens with relationships too. The big question is, how do I know whether I should stick it out with this partner? or if it is time for me to move on. It really comes back to the intention. Am I trying to run from something? Or am I really being guided on to something else? That is really helpful. Friend, sometimes even our language is a good place to start examining. Like the word should, for example, and all of those qualifiers. David, I know that idea. I know that idea comes out in a lot of literature and yet I have gone through the course and I have seen Jesus use the word should. You cannot make blanket statements about words because it is truly about the intention that is behind the words. It comes down to what is my intention? It does not work to try to identify specific words as ego words. I will give you a good example. There is a line from the Bible that is explained in the Course. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. You could jump in right away and say, That is an ego statement. In the course, Jesus amazingly takes Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord, and turns it around and gives it a different interpretation. He says, 
it is like the Holy Spirit saying, My little child, vengeance is mine. That idea does not belong in your holy mind. Give it to me. Wow, what a turnaround. Thank you. We can do the same thing for song lyrics. You hear a song, you think that it is such a special relationship song. I can't live if living is without you, or something like that. You think, that is an ego statement if I ever heard one. Then the little voice in my mind goes, turn it to God. I can't live if living is without you. What a relief. It is a good example of form versus content. There are ways of re reinterpreting things such that we do not have to get into saying something is an ego form or a Holy Spirit form. Friend, can you talk more about roles and responsibility? David, the mind is so conditioned to forms and roles and the concrete that it is all it knows. That is where the mind is. That is where the mind watching comes in. The mind watching starts to pull you away from form and move more to a sense of mind. In the song of prayer, Jesus talks about asking for specifics. He says that in the beginning, that is the only way the mind can pray. Prayer is a desire of your heart. If you believe in specifics, you are going to ask for things. Please help me pay the rent. Please help me get a better job. Please. It is all about asking for form. Ultimately, you keep moving inward and start to ask what the will of God is for you. You start to ask that question in all aspects of your life. You can see how that is a fundamental shift from asking for specifics. Now it is not to say that there is anything wrong with those earlier things because they are all stepping stones. I have heard a lot about abundance and manifesting, using the power of your mind to bring certain results, whether it is houses, cars, better jobs or parking spaces. This is a big stepping stone for the mind. If the mind believes that it is this powerless little victim, helpless in the face of the world, then it can be a great witness when you do have that goal that seems to be achieved. The car, the house, the money and so on. It can be a step to say, gee, I'm not this puny little powerless thing. My mind is powerful. It can be a good affirmation of that. And the only thing that the Course says is, okay now, right, you have a powerful mind. Instead of trying to run with the ego and get as many possessions and collect as much stuff as you can to build up your self-concept, why not use your powerful mind for a goal as high as peace of mind or eternal peace? Even those things, everything that we do along the way, are steps towards asking what the will of God is in everything. There is a real gentleness and ease that comes when I think of it that way, instead of the panic of, am I doing the right thing? Should I change relationships? What should I do, do, do? What do you want me to do? Friend, my friend was talking earlier about living in the now and the first thing that came to my mind was when my son comes up to me and says, I want to do this with you. And immediately, I'm right in the now. The perfect way that I get into the now is being reminded of those things in my life 
that need to be attended to right in the here and now. David, to me that question about living in the now really runs deep. It is basically assumed that there is a world and that there are causes in the world and there are consequences. If you do not want water, if you do not water a plant during a hot, sunny summer, the plant dries up and dies. Cause, sun, heat. Consequence, dead plant. Have sex without birth control. Cause, consequence. If you do not pay the rent, you will be evicted. Cause and consequence. The whole world is based on causes and consequences. But the world is just an effect. It is a bunch of images that are dancing shadows on a screen. That is a phenomenal idea because it totally overruns the way we do everything. All of our thinking and planning and the way we go about things used to be based on fear of consequences. Fear of consequences is all very much tied in with the ego's use of time. The ego says, You have been guilty in the past. Look at the closet full of things that you said you were going to do that you have never done. Or that you did that you should not have done. It is the guilt that is saying, You will have to pay for that. You will pay for it in the future. That is where fear comes in. That is where the ego's use of time is very fearful. You have been guilty in the past and you are going to pay in the future. Fear of consequences can be a simple thing like I have to keep my head above water because the world is going to get me in the future. Or it can be the fear of God. A lot of people project the fear of God out in, onto a final judgment day. They will pay for their sins on a final day of judgment. But when I really started to look at my life, I asked, what would it be like to live with the complete relinquishment of fear of consequences? If you could do anything that you wanted to and you could really just tune into spirit, what would you do? Friend, how do we turn our life into wanting to gain pleasure and just enjoy life rather than basing it on avoiding pain? David, the basic thing with pleasure or pain or looking for enjoyment is that we still we have still identified it as being in the world and so we are still seeking. The Course is teaching us that the world is past. I mean, if you have just done the first 10 workbook lessons, you have probably come to never, number 7. I see only the past. It can be a startling lesson. Friend, Yes, all of the thoughts in my mind are based on everything that I have already seen. And that is what I base my future on, which is an illusion. My life is a series of organized drifting with unexpected opportunities along the way. But there are beautiful and wonderful miracles at times as well. David, and you can see where this linearness is. The ego needs linear time to keep it going. The holy instant, or coming to live in the now, releases the worry about the future and the guilt and regret about the past. In holy encounters, we literally see our brothers without the past. The past is made up of judgments and reactions. Do I have a good relationship with this person or a bad one? Your ego's saying. You mentioned your issue with your friend. All those are like memories. And the ego's saying, Yes, 
That is who that guy is. All those bad memories. And that is why you should be afraid of him whenever he comes. But it is really about starting to live in the moment and trust. And it does take a lot of trust because all of us seeking to avoid those fearful consequences in the future is based on past learning. The intuition is a lot different than this is the way it worked in the past and I know this will work and da 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 da. The intuition says let go of all of that and just trust to be guided in the present moment. Let your judgment thoughts come up and look at them all, both positive and negative, and realize that both extremes are part of the judgment. A lot of times it is like you want to just let go of all negative thoughts and judgments. You want to put positive judgments or positive thoughts in place of them. But your positive judgments will hurt you as much as your negative judgments. The course differentiates from other spiritual paths where they just bring the positive in and try to get the negative out. It's the positive expectations that we have, the hierarchy of illusions, that we get so defensive about. If we are really identified with our looks in a body sense or with a car or a house or whatever, then when something seems to threaten that, we just flip out. Friend, what I hear you saying is that for there to be a positive, you have to have a negative? David, opposites again. Friend, and to look at them both equally, not make judgments on either of them? Is that right? David. Yes. Like the Zen way of watching the trains of thought go by, some of the trains will be positive judgments and some of the trains will be negative judgments. The Course is saying that spiritually we are very small children and that we cannot tell the difference between pain and pleasure. In this world, it seems obvious. It seems like we can tell the difference between pain and pleasure. You pursue one, you avoid the other. But the ego never lets it into awareness that the pursuit of both pain and pleasure reinforces the body as being real reinforcing the body as being real keeps the guilt and the belief system denied and keeps us from waking up to our spiritual reality. Ultimately, it is not a path of relinquishment or sacrifice. When we start to get miracle-minded, when we let the spirit come through us and we connect and join we start to experience such an in intrinsic joy that is not based on getting something external to satisfy or gratify us. A momentum starts to grow and we feel like we are fulfilling our function. It is like, oh, this is what I came here for. Oh yeah, now I am remembering. Then the joy and the peace start and the other stuff, the addictions and the whatever just fall away because the momentum just takes over. This makes a lot of sense to me because I know I have struggled with a lot of things regarding pain, pleasure, gratification, repression and indulgence. In this world it is like, oh, Go for the indulgence. Oh, I should not be doing that. I'm going over the boundary lines here. Pull it back. Oh, I'm repressing. I really would like to be doing that. I'm thinking about that all the time. The miracle just brings our mind into clear focus. 
the miracle is the option. There is indulgence, there is repression, and then there is the miracle. The indulgence and repression do not go anywhere. They stay horizontal. But the miracle goes up. We go back up to the source.